put the key in the car, turn the ignition, and listen to the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Long ago, there lived a king and queen who had two children, a boy and a girl. The king and queen loved their children very much, but when the king took a new wife, the queen feared for the children's safety and decided to send them away. Moved by her prayers, the god Hermes sent the queen a golden ram that could fly swiftly through the air. Tearfully, the queen set her children atop this ram and watched as it carried them away to safety. While passing over the strait that divides Europe from Asia, however, the girl, whose name was Heli, lost her balance and fell into the sea. But the boy, whose name was Phrixus, tightened his grip, and eventually he and the ram arrived in the kingdom of Colchis on the eastern shore of the Black Sea. Aedes, the king of Colchis, graciously took the boy in. They sacrificed the ram as an offering to Zeus, and Aedes placed its golden fleece in a consecrated grove under the care of a sleepless dragon. And there it remained until... Chatterbox Audio Theater presents Argonautica, as told by Apollonius of Rhodes, part one. With your help, O Phoebus, I will recount the famous deeds of men of old who at the behest of King Peleus sped the ship Argo in quest of the Golden Fleece. The king concocted this voyage in order to prevent Jason, the rightful king, from assuming the throne. As he explained, You arrive here after so many years and simply declare yourself worthy of the kingdom? You must prove your bravery to the people. You must undertake a quest that will bring glory and honor to Thessaly, and that will demonstrate beyond all doubt your strength and your courage. The wicked Peleus knew that Jason was both fearless and proud, and that he would never back down from such a challenge. He also knew that retrieving the Golden Fleece was an impossible task, and that Jason would almost certainly perish in the attempt. Undaunted, Jason sent messengers across the land, challenging the swiftest, strongest, bravest, and smartest men in Greece to aid him on his quest. His summons attracted the greatest band of heroes ever to be gathered on this earth, some 50 men in all, each extraordinary in his own way. <laughs> on the night before they set sail, these heroes passed through the streets of Yolkas to the excitement and adoration of many. Such strong men, such brave men. How I pity poor King Aedes. They will race his palace with the fires of destruction if he refuses to hand over the police. Yes, provided they can reach Colchis. The voyage is long and dangerous. What is Peleus thinking? Sending all of our best men into peril? There will be no one left to protect us here at home. First among the heroes was Heracles, he of the brave heart. In those days, he was still in the midst of carrying out his infamous labors. But for a time, at least, he set them aside, unable to resist taking part in such an adventure. Never fear, my beauties. We will return in short order, and I shall be happy to personally protect each one of you. <laughs> <laughs> With Heracles, as always, was his friend and companion, the beautiful youth, Hylas. Heracles will have him climbing aboard ship with us. You will have your work cut out for you upon our return, my lord. The Lernian Hydra offered not such a formidable challenge as these admiring women. <laughs> Alongside Heracles and Hylas strode the brave Tiphys, who was skilled at navigation and who would pilot the ship. Our timing is excellent. The winds are strong, but the seas are calm. Clearly the gods are by our side in this quest. Among them as well were the two sons of Boreas, the North Wind. Their names were Zetes and Calais, though together they were called the Boreads. Each had a pair of small wings on his ankles, which allowed him to fly swiftly through the air. Of course the winds are strong, Tippus. Do you think our father would not watch over us as we begin our quest? Also with them was the prophet Idmon, 
who was wise in the ways of the gods and who could read the future in embers and in the flight pattern of birds. It is not just the winds that are on our side, my friends. The gods have provided us with several promising oracles. We have much to be thankful for. From the Attic Island came Telamon, brother of Helios and son of King Iacchus. He was a friend of brave Heracles, and the two had many adventures together. You all live King Aetes to me. He will beg to hand over the fleece when I am done with him. No stealing this glory for yourself, Heracles. <laughs> also in their company was a violet Idas, who had extreme confidence in his own strength. Heracles? Bah! He will be as worthless to us as a thorn in the woods. Before long, the world shall forget the name of Heracles and will remember only Idas. Is that so? Uh, that is. <laughs> there were many other brave men in this company, of course. Don't leave yourself out, Orpheus. <laughs> ah, yes. I, too, was a member of the group. I, son of Calliope and Oagras, lord of Bistonian Pieria, bewitcher of the mountains and the rivers, musician of the First Order. My name... <laughs> Is Orpheus. <laughs> At the end of this crowd of heroes, striding along with his jaw set and his head held high, was the brave Jason himself. Jason! Jason, my son! Mother, dear mother, why do you weep? Today your son sets out to prove his worth to all of Thessaly. Oh, would that I had died before hearing King Peleus' evil behest. Then you might have buried me with your own hands. You, my firstborn son, in whom rests all my pride and my renown. When the poor wretched Helly plunged to her death, would that Phrixus and his ram had perished alongside her. Their good fortune now causes me sorrow and countless pains. Oh, my son, do not go. Take comfort, mother. These tears of yours will not save me from evil, but will only add grief to grief. Do not make yourself an ill omen for our voyage. My quest looms large before me, and these men and I must be brave, as must you be. Apollo has blessed us with promising oracles. Take courage in the gods and in your son's abilities. For at daybreak, we sail! That night, we camped out beneath the stars on the shore near our mighty ship. It had been constructed with the help of Athena by the famed shipbuilder Argus. In his honor, we called it the Argo. Alice, my boy, if you don't quit filling my cup with wine, my belly will explode. Oh, has the brave Heracles finally met a challenge he cannot face? Stop, you scoundrel! Uh, fill it up then! Why, I'll outdrink any man here! Well, noble Edmund, to you is given the gift of prophecy. Your eye sees across the days and nights, and your ear is attuned to the voices of the gods. Gaze into the fire, and tell us what you see. As you request, Jason, but I warn you, I must convey whatever it is Apollo shows me. I cannot hold back the truth. Before you, brave Jason, the news is joyous. It is the will of heaven and destiny that you return here with the fleece. Hera, herself unhappy with the lack of respect accorded her by King Peleus, shall be your protector. But countless trials await, and not all who join you in this quest shall be as fortunate as you. By the hateful decree of Zeus, I, for my part, am fated to die in some distant land, as are many of you others. And yet we embark nonetheless in order to bring glory and honor to our houses. Naturally, this dim prophecy cast a chill over the Argonauts. The impetuous Idas, however, who was full of excitement for the journey, not to mention wine, spoke up thusly. Tremble not, you cowards! Lift your gaze from your sandals. Why do you look so pale? Does fear master you? Fear which confounds the weak. Look here, you have Idas with you on your side. Witness my powerful spear, which aids me more than Zeus himself. Even should the gods oppose you, with Idas on your side, you shall be safe. Uh, Enough, Idas, you vain wretch. You're only inviting destruction upon yourself. 
There are many words a man might use to comfort his companions. Why must you dishonor the gods in order to bring us cheer? You know so much, do you, Edmund? Tell me then, if you can, what do the gods decree for me? But take care how you answer. For if I catch you making another idle prophecy, you may not escape me with your life. You may be still. How dare you quarrel with one another on this of all nights? Before our quest has even begun? Idas, hang your head in shame. We must honor the gods if we're to have any chance of success. Now then, the time for revelry is past. We must sleep. We sail at first light and there remains much work to be done. We have drawn the ship down to the sea, Jason. We have placed the equipment on board and assigned the rowing benches by lot. What other work remains? We must build an altar and offer sacrifice to Apollo. But first, my brave companions, we must officially choose a leader. We must name the bravest and wisest men among us and agree to defer to him in all, in the path we choose, in the choices we make, and in our quarrels and covenants with any strangers we may encounter. <laughs> a leader? Why, is it not obvious? Who else among us could command such a group of men? Who has already demonstrated his abilities beyond all doubt? Will Heracles cast himself in the role without even consulting his fellow Argonauts? <laughs> As always, dear Hylas, you do me wrong. Brave Jason, there is but one man among us who could take on such a mantle, and that man is you. All in favor? <laughs> it is settled then. You must accept, Jason. I do accept, humbly, and I ask the gods to guide us on our way. Let us prepare a sacrifice to Apollo, the far darter, whom we will pray watch over us. And so, we Argonauts set about constructing an altar to the god, while the night deepened and the waves lapped gently against the shore. Orpheus, a song. As you wish, Jason. Sing now of heaven, the earth, and the sea. All in creation found places to be. Once in beginning, one form were they married. Great tumult within had the mole turned asunder. The mountains arose and the stars found their place in the sky. When dawn came, we Argonauts loosed the ship's mooring ropes, settled into our assigned rowing benches, and set off on our journey. Row! 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 Heracles and Telamon took the center bench, using their immense strength to set the pace for all the other rowers. With their power and the sure hand of Tiphys guiding the rudder, we sped away from the port of Iolcus and out into the open sea. Already the gods look with favor upon us, my friends. Do you feel the strong wind that Hera sends from Olympus to push us forward? Put down your oars. Set the mast in the mast box. Raise the sail. And with that, we were on our way, sailing swiftly east toward the far-off land of Colchis. The very fish of the sea followed in the Argo's path, as if cheering us onward. And all the gods looked down from heaven at the mighty ship as it carried us, the best of all men, farther and farther from our homes. Now, in those days when navigation was in its infancy and the seas were full of dangers, men preferred not to sail at night. Whenever possible, sailors would put in at a new port each sundown and rest and replenish as necessary before continuing on their way. The nearby coastline and the many islands of the Mediterranean made this possible. For three days then, we sailed, stopping each evening on deserted shores to take our rest and continuing on at the first light of day. We set our sails when the wind was up. When it was down, we rowed tirelessly, hour after hour. Row! 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 On the fourth evening, we put in at the island of Limnus, 
home to a race of men whose conquering spirit was legendary throughout the world, which is why we were surprised by the crowd that met us at the shore. <laughs> Welcome, noble Argonauts. We have heard of your quest and are pleased to receive you here at Lemnos. Jason, look at them, all women, and not a single man in sight. Then already we have encountered the one danger that could possibly overtake us. Uh, hello, my dear. I, I notice you are admiring our ship. Thank you for your kind welcome. Yes, we seek rest and any food and supplies that may aid us on our journey. Pray, take me to the ruler of this island. Uh, who is your friend? Oh, a sister. I should have guessed. Look no further, Jason. I, Hypsipyle, am ruler of Lemnus. You? But what of King Thoas? What of the Limnian men whose crusades are known far and wide? King Thoas was my father, but he and those men you speak of are Lemnians no more. They have been banished from this land in shame and dishonor. How is this possible? Listen, and I shall tell you. After raiding neighboring Thrace, the Lemnian men became more interested in their captured slave girls than in their own lawful wives. Our children and our families were ignored, and a bastard race took root among us. At long last, after suffering these and many other indignities, we prayed for the strength to close our homes to those treacherous men. Forced to choose, our husbands preferred to live with their slave girls in Thrace, taking with them every one of our male-born sons. Then you have been abandoned. We have. And for this reason, we are eager to welcome you brave Argonauts into our homes and even into our beds. I have instructed my subjects to take all care of you. Yeah. My sisters, here is such a group of men as has never before roamed this earth. Treat them as you would your husbands, had your husbands been honorable and true. As for you, dear Jason, you will accompany me to the palace, where I shall care for you personally. And so, the Argonauts' first encounter on our journey proved to be far from deadly. Each man was taken into one of the Lindian women's homes. I myself was claimed by a pale young beauty whom I captivated with the sound of my lyre. She was on the petite side, which I must admit is my preference, and her hair cascaded in golden ringness down her back. Her scent, if words could even attempt to describe it, was something of the, the morning mist. Orpheus! Oh. Yes, yes. Of course. <clears throat> it was decided that at least two Argonauts should stay behind to watch the ship, foregoing the company of the Limnian women. To the surprise of all, Heracles volunteered for this duty. And to the surprise of none, Hylas volunteered along with him. Ah, Hylas, what a beautiful night it is. Look at those stars. Why? I believe there are as many stars in the sky above us as there are grains of sand on the beach below. Did my lord not wish to partake of the festivities? Hmm? No, oh, no, 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 Hylas. Uh, what need have I for the affections of lonely women? So long as I have you by my side, I want for nothing at all. My lord, you flatter me. From the day you took me as your arms bearer, I have served you well, have I not? Oh, of course you have, Hylas. And since that time, your beauty, grace, loyalty, and skill have only grown. I challenge my fellow sailors to find any such companion in the beds they borrow tonight. I do worry that this diversion will distract us from our quest, Heracles. Yes. Poor fools. Did we leave our homes in search of brides? Well, there are brides aplenty in Thessaly. No. We will win no glory here, locked indoors with foreign women. But perhaps a night or two will satisfy these ravenous men, and then we will be on our way. Come closer to me, Hylas, my boy. Look at those stars. Look at those stars. <laughs> Meanwhile, 
within the Lemnian Palace, Jason was attended to by the beautiful Hypsipyle. My lord appears deep in thought. I had intended to take your mind off any matters of concern. What more may I offer you? Nothing at all, gentle Hypsipyle. Obviously, I cannot level a single complaint against your uh, hospitality. But the strange fate of the Lemnian men yet moves me and preoccupies my mind. Lust is a very powerful emotion, my lord, and makes both men and women do strange things. That much is certainly true. Hypsipyle, that cloak you were wearing, the one with such vibrant colors with the scenes of the creation and the boyhood of Zeus, where did it come from? It is beautiful, is it not? Athena herself gave it to my father, Thoas. It has become the mantle of the ruler of Lemnus, which is why I myself now consent to wear it. May I see it? My lord, dear Jason, you may do much more than see it. If you so choose, you may don it and wear it from now until the end of your days. I'm not certain I understand your meaning. We women have created a good home here in the absence of our men, Jason. We perform their labors as well as our own, and thanks to the gods, we prosper. But ultimately, without men, we are lost. Our race will die out within a few short years. And what do you ask of me? Stay, my lord. Stay here at Lemnus and rule as our king. Together with your Argonauts, we shall create a new race, more beautiful and powerful than any ever seen on this earth. And you would be my queen. If my lord would have me as such, I would be honored. It is a compelling offer, dear Hypsipyle, but we are engaged in a momentous quest, and I, I. Is something wrong, my lord? The cloak. It is indeed quite beautiful, but look here. There is a tear in its center, a tear that appears to be lined with blood. Hypsipyle. You told us that King Thoas and the men of this island chose to live in Thrace. Are you being truthful? Well? I was truthful in nearly all, my lord. The men of the island did fall into shameful love for their Thracian slave girls. And the gods did give us women the strength to retaliate. But in truth, we sent them away. Sent them to where? To Thrace? No, my lord. Much farther. We sent all of our men to Hades, along with every one of our male children in order to ensure that such a betrayal would never occur again. You mean to say that? You have murdered your husbands and your children. What wicked God guided your hand in this? Please, my lord, judge us not, for we suffered greatly under the hatred of our husbands. It was the will of Herod that we should have our revenge. I confess this to you in strictest confidence, Jason. You must keep our secret as you would one of your own. Destruction is sure to befall us if the wider world learns of what we have done. I beg you, Jason, we mean you no harm, and already we have suffered so much. Do not doom us to further miseries. Can I trust you? Next morning, Jason roused the Argonauts from our various bedchambers and brought us together. Tiffus, how are the winds this morning? They appear to be favorable, Jason. Not a cloud in the sky. Then all of you, prepare the ship. We sail today. <laughs> Jason, why this sudden rush? Surely the fleece will wait for us another few days. I agree with Telemann. In truth, Jason, I myself have been promised several things. And I would like to... At least see some of these things come to fruition. Right. Prepare yourself for disappointment then, Orpheus. We depart today. What is the reason for this hurry, Jason? You must at least tell us that. Yeah. 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 Listen to me, you men. In choosing me as your leader, you each agreed to abide by my judgment in all matters. I'm asking you to abide by it now, without complaint and without question. I cannot tell you why. I can tell you only that it must be so. We sail immediately. No, oh, come on then, you belly acres. What more do you need? Your leader orders it. Load the cargo. Pick up your oars. Off we go. <laughs> Jason. You may rest easy, Hypsipyle. I will tell the men nothing. I would still have you stay here and serve as our king, my lord. No. We must continue onward. Our quest has only just begun. Last night you were admiring my father's cloak. 
and I was prepared to give it to you. I would still like to do so, Jason. But I tell you, I cannot be your king. Not now, perhaps, but take it from me regardless. If at some point fate brings you back to this island, you may claim the kingship as your own. In the meantime, if any children are born to us Lemnian women by your Argonauts, I will consider us most fortunate. Goodbye, Jason. May the gods be with you on your quest. And so we left the island of Lemnus and rode for several more days. The sun hung high above us, and at times the heat was nearly unbearable. Through it all, however, mighty Heracles kept a steady rhythm with his oar. Tiphys's navigation remained precise and true, and we proceeded with great swiftness. After another few days, we had crossed the Aegean, and we entered the Black Sea through the dangerous Hellespont, that same place where the child Heli had fallen from the back of the golden ram and drowned. Just past this point, we docked at an island known as the Mount of Bears. There, we were received with great enthusiasm by the inhabitants of the land, the Doliones, and their king, Sisychus. He offered us a great banquet and much hospitality. You heroes are always welcome here. You may remain among the Doliones as long as you like. But take care, Argonauts. The other inhabitants of this land are not so friendly as we. Other inhabitants? Who are they? There roams through this land a race of earth-born men, savages, with six arms sprouting from their torsos. We are protected from these vicious men by decree of the god Poseidon, but they are not very fond of visitors. Zetes, Calais, you sons of Boreas, perhaps you should return to the ship and ensure that it is safe from these six-armed men. Of course, Jason. We shall go there straight away. Zetes and Calais flapped the wings on their ankles and took to the air. Never fear, Jason. The might of this band of heroes will be more than enough to overcome the earthborn. Do not let concern darken your brow. Instead, eat, drink, laugh. There is much to celebrate. Unnerved by the description of the strange creatures inhabiting the land, Zetes and Calais sped toward the harbor where the Argo was moored. When they arrived, they saw lying in wait the vicious earthborn, the savage six-armed men that King Sisychus had described. <sighs> the sons of Boreas returned swiftly to the palace to raise the alarm. Jason, King Sisychus, friends! The six-armed men sit in ambush for us at the harbor. They are armed from battle. Even from high above, we could see the bloodlust in their eyes. We must not let them destroy our ship or terrorize this land further. Argonauts, we go now into battle. Take up your arms! You, Doliones, do the same, for we fight alongside you, Jason, to the death! The battle against the Earthborn was long and difficult. Each enemy had six arms, and each arm wielded a deadly weapon. When those weapons were exhausted, the Earthborn uprooted large boulders to throw at us. Take that, you vile thing! And here's something for you as well! It's two more for Telemus, and we'll see who slays the greater number of these beasts! Come here, you! Though we Argonauts emerged unscathed, or at least without any loss of life, many Doliones were felled. But King Sisychus had been right. The power of the Earthborn was no match for us, especially with the Doliones on our side. When the battle was ended, the bodies of the Earthborn lay stacked in great piles, like cords of wood. Exhausted, we Argonauts cleaned our swords and thanked the gods for victory. The Doliones battled bravely, Sisychus. You have great, great honor to yourselves. We will not forget your actions. Thank you, Jason. And yet, now I despair. In fighting the Earthborn, we break our covenant with Poseidon and risk losing his protection. You Argonauts will leave us soon. Once you are gone, I fear another attack may come. And next time, we shall not be so fortunate. Jason, excuse me, please, your highness. What is it, Tiphys? A storm is coming, Jason. If we are to sail at any time in the next few days, we must do so soon. Sail? Now? But the men are exhausted. It matters not, Telamon. 
Argonauts, prepare yourselves. We sail immediately. As Jason commanded, the Argonauts rushed aboard ship and put out to sea as quickly as possible. But we were not quick enough. Within minutes, a violent storm overtook us, casting down rain and lightning as though from the hands of mighty Zeus himself. Row! 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 Damn you! Row! We rowed mightily, but it was of no use. The Argo was tossed about in the waves like a piece of driftwood. Before long, the ship was run aground, and we were forced to disembark on a windswept shore. As we emerged from the ship, seeking shelter from the wind and the rain, we once again found ourselves under attack. Ah! Ah! Who is it? What are these sense upon us? I am blinded by the wind and the rain. It is impossible to tell. Well, don't just stand by and allow us all to be slaughtered. Protect yourselves. Protect the Argo. Fight! Fight! And so, the weary Argonauts were caught in yet another battle. This one carried out nearly blind amid a terrible storm. Whoever you are, you made a mistake in attacking us. A fatal mistake. We will not subject. Just as Jason struck down his opponent, however, the rain weakened and shafts of sun pierced the clouds above. Stop! Stop! You men, stop your fighting! We've been tricked most evilly by the blinding storm. We battle with our friends. We are slaying the Doliones! It was true. The storm had blown us back to the Mount of the Bear. The Doliones, fearing we were another wave of the Earthborn, had attacked. The men we now cut down with our swords were the same men who had fought valiantly alongside us hours earlier. And Jason's sword had just struck down the noble King Sisychus himself. The storm continued for 12 days after that, as though all of nature were enraged by our mistake. In fact, the skies did not fully calm until we Argonauts, on the advice of Idmon, offered up a sacrifice to Hera. At long last, we were able to leave that unfortunate land now ravaged behind us. You too, Hylas? Do you surrender? Ha! And what of noble Canthos? No? Too much for you, is it? Why, I've got days of rowing left in me. In an attempt to cheer the crew, Heracles devised a contest to see who could row the fastest for the longest period of time. And naturally, it was a contest heavily weighted in his favor. But the Argonauts, eager for a distraction, took him up on it. One of you, Orpheus. Why, you haven't even tried. No, thank you. My talents lie elsewhere. <laughs> well, then, who is left to challenge me? You, Telamon, and you, Idis. Do your best, then. By the time this contest is over, we shall have pushed this boat around the world and back. All heads turned at this sound. Heracles, in his enthusiasm, had rowed so hard that he split his giant oar in two. Heracles is out of the contest! <laughs> You swine! Why, I'd take up another oar this instant, but I would break it before you could set yours to water. Well, you wait until I replace my oar, and then the contest begins anew. Later that evening, we stopped on a lonely shoreline for a brief respite and to offer sacrifice to the gods. Do not linger, men. We can make more progress before the night falls. While Jason and the other Argonauts busied themselves, Heracles slipped off into the forest to find a suitable oar. Ah, here we are. A mighty tree. No, no, too short. Well, how about you, my pretty? No, not strong enough. But, ah, but here. Ah, oh, this pine tree is perfect. Not too many branches, nice and straight. Come with me, my darling. Heracles will now make you a part of history. Ah! 
Meanwhile, back at the shore, the Argonauts were preparing to depart. Hylas, I'm told we sail soon. Get aboard as quickly as you can. Has Heracles returned? Heracles is your burden, not mine. I haven't any idea where he's gone. Not to worry. Not to worry, I'll find him. He can't have made it far. And so, Hylas set out to find Heracles. In his wandering, he came across a stream, pure and beautiful and cold. He knelt down to have a drink. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Unfortunately for Hylas, the nymph who lived in the stream was immediately taken by his beauty and decided that she would have him for her husband. There you are. <laughs> I see you under the water. Why, oh, you're beautiful. <laughs> you're... No! No! Let me go! Heracles! Help me! Heracles! Elsewhere in the forest, Heracles heard Hylas call for him. He dropped the pine tree and rushed to where Hylas' voice had come from. Hylas! But all he found was a quietly bubbling stream. Hylas! Hylas! Meanwhile, the Argonauts, in a hurry to set sail, cast off. We were several miles from shore before Telamon said, Wait! No wonder it is so quiet. Where is Heracles? Why is he not at his bench? His oar broke, Telamon. He cannot row anymore. But where is he? Is he at the rudder with Tiphys? I... I don't believe so. I cannot see him anywhere. Or Hylas, for that matter. Hylas? That doe-eyed little thing said something about going into the forest to find Heracles. He did. When was this? Shortly before we set sail, if I recall. Oh. Oh, no. Jason, Jason! We have abandoned Heracles and Hylas. We must go back. Go back? We will lose hours from our journey. Hylas is right. Going back would mean sailing against the wind. It would be tremendously costly in both time and energy. But we can't just leave them behind. Jason. Jason, we can't. Jason, I am sorry to say, was overcome with indecision and offered no answer. Will you sit there at your ease, then? Sit there while we abandon two of the noblest members of our quest! Yes, all of you! You sit there if you want! But I am going after Heracles and Hylas if I have to swim back to shore! Now who is with me? Come on! Come on! Don't be fools, you men! You'll drown yourselves and we'll lose half our crew for nothing! Nothing?! Why, you! You get out of my way! Just then, however, there was a tremendous churning in the water before the ship. We all rushed to the prow to see its cause. As we watched in awe, there emerged from the depths the enormous head and shoulders of the sea god, Laucus. Heed me, Argonauts. Why, against the counsel of mighty Zeus, do you propose to lead Heracles to the city of the Aetes? It is his fate to accomplish his twelve labors and to dwell with the immortals for eternity. As for Hylas, a goddess nymph has made him her husband. Do not weep for either, and do not interrupt your quest. You must continue forward. The loss of Heracles and Hylas was a tremendous blow to the Argonauts, but a personal appeal from the gods is nothing to be taken lightly. We continued on our way. Days passed. Without Heracles' powerful rowing, we progressed more slowly, and the winds were not always favorable, but we persisted. Eventually, we reached the coast of a land called Salmadesos. Upon disembarking, we found the home of a very old, very blind man. His name was Phineas. He told us his sad tale. I am a prophet, a seer, if you will, even though I lack my sight. I was not always blind in this way. Lord Zeus became angry with me over my prophecies. I revealed too much of the gods' plans. So to punish me, Zeus took my eyesight and cursed me with extended old age. What's more, I am allowed to eat almost nothing. If people from the nearby village bring me food, but as soon as the first morsel touches my lips, the harpies descend and snatch it away from me. Harpies? 
monstrous beasts, the part bird, part woman, and part wind. Their shrill cries will cause any man to shiver in revulsion. They swoop down upon me and snatch the food from my hands, befouling with an unendurable stench any other food that might make it to my lips. And I'm left with just enough to survive. But I live in misery, darkness, and constant fear. If it is within our power, Phineas, we will take this curse from you. It is not within your power, Jason. But it was foretold by the gods that the two sons of Boreas, Zetes and Calais, could chase the vile harpies away, permitting me to eat once more. If this is indeed possible, then in return, I shall give you information that will be invaluable to you as you continue on your quest. Zetes, Calais, it appears as though this task falls to you. What is your response? Poor man, what mortal has suffered worse affliction than you? Why have you of all men been burdened with so many woes? It was mere thoughtlessness that caused you to sin against the gods. Phineas, we will lie in wait for these dread harpies, and when the time is right, we will chase them down and kill them, and rid you of this curse forever. We will do this for you, Phineas, provided you can swear to us that it will not bring down the disfavor of any gods. Phineas swore, and the Argonauts set about laying their trap. They prepared a banquet for Phineas and bade him sit. The Boreads hid beneath the table, and the other Argonauts concealed themselves as well. Then, just as Phineas put the first bite of food to his lips, they come! Now, Calais! As the terrible creatures descended, Zetes and Calais leapt from under the table with their swords drawn. The harpies, upon seeing them, turned and fled. <laughs> The wings of the brothers' ankles carried them after the beast in close pursuit. Faster, Zetes! We mustn't lose them! Awful beasts! We'll see that you never torture anyone again! Such was their intent. But just as Calais was reaching out a hand to grab one of the harpies, a giant female form appeared before them amid the clouds. Stop! Sons of Boreas, I am the goddess Iris, the swift-footed, the cloud-waterer messenger between Olympians and humans. Stay your hands! It is not permitted by the gods to slay the harpies. Those dread beasts belong to Zeus, and any man harming them will provoke his wrath. But I will promise you that, thanks to your bravery, they will never again visit the prophet Phineas. Having secured this oath, the Boreads returned to Phineas and the Argonauts to share the goddess's decree. Then, for the first time in many years, Phineas sat down to an uninterrupted meal. Grapes, and cheeses, and bread, and roasted lamb. Oh, how I've missed you all. My poor empty stomach will finally be filled again, and I shall make myself as fat as a cow. And so, Phineas, the harpies are defeated at the hands of my men. In return, you promised us information that will help us as we continue our journey. Yes, Jason. It is not permitted by the gods that you should know everything. But I can tell you this. In order to reach Colchis, you must pass through the Simplicides, the clashing rocks. These rocks are not fixed to the bottom of the sea, but crash together constantly, destroying anything that happens to be between them. No ship has ever succeeded in passing from one side to the other. So therefore, follow my advice, Jason, and the advice of the gods. Before attempting to pass through the Simplicides, you must release a dove from the bow of your ship and send it through the passageway between the rocks. If it survives, then when the rocks are open once more, Row with all your might. If you are brave and swift, as swift as the dove, you will succeed in passing through. And once on the other side, if the gods are still with you, you will receive a sign from them. And if the dove does not survive? Well, then turn back, Jason, for I promise that nothing but violent death awaits you. Once Phineas had eaten his fill... We left him, still old and still blind, but happy at last. 
safe travels. Visit me on your return, and we shall lay out another feast, or perhaps two. Before departing, I use my lyre to lure a dove into my reach. Oh. That's it. That's it, pretty thing. Hold still. Yes. <laughs> then we set out. We rode for several more days, until at last we came upon the place Phineas had warned us about, the Simplicides, or the Clashing Rocks. Jason, we cannot get any closer without being caught by the swell. Well, well, Tiffus. Orpheus, do you have the dove? Right here. I would have named her, but I feared becoming too attached. The rocks are parting. Now, Orpheus, release the dove. As if shot from a bow, the dove bolted off toward the Simplicides, which drew apart in preparation for another tremendous crash. While the entire crew watched, the little dove fluttered madly through the space between the rocks as that space grew, then shrank again, and finally... Where is it? What happened? Can anyone see? Yes. Yes, it's there. Wounded, perhaps, but still flying. Back to your stations, then, men, and row. Row with all your might. Row! The Argo sped forward as it had never sped before, not even with the mighty Heracles propelling it. We pushed and strained against the terrible current. The rocks parted, then began to come together once again. We felt the Argo rising as the waters between the rocks were pressed together. And then... We... We made it! Tiffus, <laughs> any damage? The stern ornament was sheared off. The Argo may be less beautiful, but she is no less functional. And look! The rocks have ceased their movement. Yes. It was said that they would lock together for eternity if ever any men managed to pass through them. Then the legend was wrong. By which I, I mean, we're not just any men, are we? Just then, the little bird fluttered back down to light upon my shoulder. But, hello, my friend. What luck you've had today. I believe I shall name you after all. The dove is safe, Orpheus, and so are we. The gods have decreed it. Yes, Jason. But look, just like us, the tips of her tail feathers have been sheared off. But the Argonauts ignored this very interesting and witty observation. Their attention had been captured by something towering in the distance. What? What is that? It is a sign, just as Phineas promised. The gods now set foot upon the earth. In the distance, an enormous figure strode across the shore of an island. His golden hair shone as bright as the sun, and his long bow stretched from the treetops to the clouds. It is the god himself. It is Apollo. Look, already he is disappearing, vanishing into the clouds above. Jason. Jason, what do we do? We sail for that shore, my friends, and there we build a shrine to Apollo, whom we now know travels alongside us on our journey. Sacrifices may be meager, Lord Apollo, but they are heartfelt. When these men return home, they will honor you with the finest offerings in the land. We thank you for your watchful eye. You there! And f Hello! Who is it? Who approaches? It is four men, four men in rags, emerging from the woods. Help us, please. We have been shipwrecked here for many weeks since our boat was destroyed by the Simplicides. You heroes who braved and bested the clashing rocks, you must help us return home. Where is your home? Who are you? I am called Argus, noble sir. These men are my brothers. We are the sons of Phrixus, he who escaped to Colchis on the Golden Ram. We have lived in that country all our lives, and were returning there when misfortune befell us. Colchis, that is our destination. Can you guide us the rest of the way? Yes. If you will consent to return us there, we will happily guide you. And so, along with the four shipwrecked men, we set sail once more. Naturally, even with these guides, the path was not always easy. And there were other adventures along the way.
But we rode and rode, sailed and navigated, battled and starved. And then, at long last, we Argonauts entered the mouth of the Phocis River and thereby reached our destination, landing on the shores of the distant country of Colchis. You have been listening to part one of Chatterbox Audio Theater's live production of Argonautica by Apollonius of Rhodes, featuring Chris Jowers as Jason, Billy Pullen as Orpheus, Joe Vescovo as Heracles, Odell Atkinson as Hylas, Jim Robinson as Idmon and Phineas, Joe Carolino as Telemann, Brent Morgan as Tiphys and Zetes, Ross Williams as Idas, Calais and Sisychus, and Abigail Amsden as Hypsipyle, also featuring the voices of Natalie Jones and Renee Kemper. Music composed and conducted by Renee Kemper. Violin by Anthony Gilbert. Piano by Renee Kemper. Oboe and English horn by Nathan Nix. And guitar and mandolin by Ed Richter. Sound effects coordinated by Bill Short. Script consultation by David Sick. Produced by James Antoine. Assistant directed by Tommy Harless. Adapted and directed by Robert Arnold. This is your announcer, Tom Badgett. Chatterbox Audio Theater is a nonprofit, web based community theater that advances the exchange of ideas by channeling creativity and artistic collaboration into recorded audio works that enlighten, entertain, and inspire. Download our shows, meet our cast and crew, and make a donation to support our work at www.chatterboxtheater.org. Hey everyone, it's Mark from Leap Audio. I'm here to tell you about something really exciting. July 24 through 26 of 2020, Halifax, Nova Scotia, We are gathering together in the world's first international modern audio drama convention and family reunion. Inspired in part by the living, loving memory of our dear friend Bill Hallwake, we're bringing together writers, producers, actors, and our fans for workshops, seminars, and even live performances. So join us, won't you? Go to madcon.com. That's www.mad-con.com for more information. I hope to see you in Halifax in 2020. You're listening to the Mutual Audio Network. Have a good day.